All right, thermodynamics is the study of energy and its transfer uh, in physical matter. So in this context, the matter involved in energy transfer is termed a system, uh, while everything outside of it is the surroundings. So for instance, when heating water on a stove, the system is the stove, the pot, and the water, and the energy transferred within it. And its surroundings would be your kitchen, or you know, maybe you're camping and it's you know, uh, around a fire or something. So the surroundings around it, and then your system. Uh, Systems can be open, exchanging energy with the surroundings, or closed, so there's no exchange between your system and the surroundings. Um, biological organisms are considered open systems. We interact with our surroundings um, by using energy from the sun for photosynthesis, um, or consuming energy storing molecules, like eating, um, and then releasing energy into the environment. Um, we release energy into the environment in a lot of different forms, from just heat to uh, when we we die and we degrade. Um, so these processes, excuse me, these processes all adhere to the laws of thermodynamics, uh, which govern energy transfer in all systems. All right, let's go ahead and define energy. So this is the capacity to induce change or perform work, uh, and it comes in various forms like electrical light and heat energy. Um, understanding the physical laws that regulate energy flow into and out of biological systems is really important for understanding how, how the organism functions. So we've got a couple of examples on the slide um, of how energy transfer can be transferred and transformed from one system to another and then from one form to another. So the food we consume provides our cells with the energy required to carry out bodily functions, just as light energy provides plants with the means to create the chemical energy it needs. Um, so the first law of thermodynamics um, states that the total energy in the universe remains constant and cannot be created or destroyed. Um, it can only change forms or transfer between systems. So like we saw, you know, you eat that ice cream and you get the sugar rush and now you can ride your bike, woo. Um, that energy didn't just appear, right? We consumed it from the food. That ice cream was made out of, oh, milk and sugar and salt, I suppose. Um, that came from, you know, a cow and the sugar probably came from a beet, a uh, sugar beet. Um, <clears throat> the cow ate grass, right? All of it, it's all coming around in a circle. Um, nothing is being created or destroyed. It's just changing form. So energy transformations are common in our surroundings, right? It's happening all around us all the time, from light bulbs converting electrical energy into light and heat, um, or plants converting sunlight into chemical energy um, in the form of glucose, right? Um, living cells face the challenge of obtaining energy in usable forms. So you and I can't just step outside into the sun and, and make glucose, right? Um, we have to go find something that has done that. Uh, and then we can consume you know, that plant or you know, the ice cream, what have you. Um, so typically what's gonna happen is you know, we pull in these nutrients and we're gonna convert them in some way into usable ATP. That's, that's the idea. Um, so that we can build new things, so that we can power reactions. Um, it's more complicated than just that, but that's kind of the, the foundation of it is we have to bring in all this stuff so that we can make ATP so that we can build things and that we can move our muscles and and all of that sort of thing so that was the first law of thermodynamics so nothing can be created or destroyed the energy that exists in the universe is is what it is um, but the second law of thermodynamics introduces the concept of entropy hopefully you remember this from some time in high school um, this signifies the measure of disorder in a system if you think back to when we talked in chapter one, right, we talked about how ordered living things are. So energy transfers and transformations are never completely efficient. You never get 100% transfer of that energy. Um, you're gonna lose some, typically in the form of heat, uh, especially when we're talking about living organisms. Um, but you can even see it with a, you know, a lamp sitting on your desk. That light bulb in it, it's warm or hot, depending on what kind of bulb you have. Um, you're losing some of the energy that is, you know, the electrons coming down the power line. Um, it's creating the light, but you're losing some of that energy to heat from that light. Um, so 
Basically, the second law asserts that systems tend to become more disordered over time. And with higher entropy, as energy is lost um, to the surroundings, um, that energy goes back out. All right, so living organisms, in order to maintain their ordered state, have to have constant inputs of energy. Okay, so the universe is trying to go back towards that more, more entropy, less order, right? That's, that's the direction the reactions are driving towards, is disorder. But to be a living organism, you must be ordered, so you have to feed the energy back in. So every reaction that you have going on in your body is releasing heat, and <clears throat> then we have to go eat more food, drink more water, breathe in air, um, in order to pull us back towards that ordered state. So <clears throat> let's look a little bit at potential versus kinetic energy. So when an object is in motion, it possesses kinetic energy, like a moving wrecking ball or a speeding bullet. <clears throat> so even objects at rest have energy. We call that potential energy. So for example, when a motionless wrecking ball is, is lifted up, so it's not moving yet, the energy used to raise that ball is stored as potential energy due to its position and the force of gravity. The energy can transform into kinetic energy when the ball falls. Um, and so all that potential is lost, diminished, transformed into kinetic until the ball then comes to rest on the ground. And then it becomes potential energy again. Um, potential energy isn't solely related to position, but also to the structure of the matter. So compressed springs, uh, stretched rubber bands, uh, the molecular bonds of all chemical compounds all contain potential energy. So when we talk about those sugar molecules, those bonds, those carbon bonds, um, they hold a lot of potential energy. Um, all the food that we consume, all the bonds, right? They're going to contain this potential energy that we can utilize. Um, so when we break these bonds, that energy is released kinetic. It goes from being potential to breaking kinetic and releasing that energy that we can then capture for use in other things. So once we understand that chemical reactions release energy when breaking energy storing bonds, the question arises, how can we quantify and compare the energy released in different types of reactions. So to measure these energy transfers, we use the term free energy, uh, which represents the usable energy available for doing work um, in, any, in any given reaction. Um, so that's going to account for energy loss as heat, um, right? We've got to abide by the second law of thermodynamics. So how, you know, are we going to have to feed energy in or is energy going to be released? So in a chemical reaction where energy is released, where we release energy into the system, we call this um, <clears throat> uh, a change in delta G um, that is negative. Okay, that's in the little picture. You see the little triangle next to the G? That triangle is a delta, and we use that to denote change. That can be positive change or negative change. Um, so if we're releasing energy into the system, um, that's going to be negative delta G. Um, so that's a negative free energy. Um, this means the products have less energy than the reactants did. Okay, so there was energy stored in the reactant. And when that was broken, the energy was released. And now what's left has less energy than the original than the original reactant had, okay? Why? Because we lost some of that stored potential energy uh, to entropy, to heat, when we broke those bonds, right? It's never completely efficient. Um, let's see. Okay, and then we can look at the other direction where if the reaction absorbs energy overall, we call that delta G positive, um, and it indicates that the products have more free energy uh, than the reactants had. Um, these are endergonic reactions and are non-spontaneous. Um, they require an input of free energy to occur, right? We can't just make energy out of nothing. We have to feed energy into that system to then create that new bond or whatever it is. Um, so we've got some pictures of a couple of endergonic processes. So these are ones that require 
energy to be fed in. So um, we've got what? Growing a plant and uh, little chicks, right? Those, re those the reactions to lead to those things uh, are intergon. We've got to feed energy into the system. Um, and then we've got a ball rolling down a hill, right? We're releasing energy. We went from all this stored potential energy to rapidly releasing it. And it's um, now turned kinetic. And when it gets to the bottom of the hill, it has less potential energy than it did at the top. All right, it's important to note that even exergonic reactions, which we term spontaneous, they still need a small amount of input energy to get it going. We call this activation energy, and it's a really fundamental aspect of all chemical reactions. So even though the overall um, direction of the reaction is you know, more, more potential energy in the reactants and less in the products, we do have to have that little push to make it happen.